Character strength in fighting games is not a one-dimensional thing. Despite what the tier lists may lead you to believe, fighting game characters are rarely objectively stronger or objectively weaker than their opponents. Sometimes a character will be strong against one character, but weak against another, and this is what is called a matchup. Usually, matchups are determined on a percentage scale, where a character's matchup is determined based on this situation. If two players of equal skill play 10 matches with these two characters, who wins more matches? This determines the matchup between those two characters, which is then converted into a percent. For example, one of the most polarizing matchups in fighting games would be Dalsim vs Zangief in Street Fighter 2. This matchup is usually considered to be 8-2 Dalsim's favor, meaning that in a match with equally skilled players, Dalsim will win 80% of the time, or win 8 out of 10 matches in a best of 10. After a character's matchups have all been determined and generally agreed upon, they are placed upon a tier list based on how many good matchups they have and how important these matchups will be. However, the important thing to note here is the word important itself. You see, if a character has 49 bad matchups and one good matchup, but the 49 other characters they lose to are never played and the one character they beat is in every single match, then even though the math says this character is unviable, that character would likely perform the best in the competitive scene. Obviously, this is a super polarized example, but there are situations where something like this can happen. For the most famous example, let's take a look at the famous Hakan comeback in the match between Infiltration and PR Balrog at EVO 2013. First, let me give you the context of the situation. Infiltration, an Akuma main, and PR Balrog, a Balrog main, meet in top 8 for Ultra Street Fighter 4 at EVO 2013. Akuma has a losing matchup against Balrog, and PR Rog uses this to his advantage, taking a 2-1 lead against Infiltration. In this situation, Infiltration would need to win two games in a row in a losing matchup in order to take home the set, not to mention the fact that PR Rog had gotten some key adjustments against Infiltration's Akuma that would have made him struggle even further. So, instead of trying to weather the storm and overcome the fight with Akuma, Infiltration pulls an unexpected pocket Hakan, and after an impressive comeback, proceeds to win the two matches he needed to win in order to defeat PR Rog and move on in bracket. Now, what's important to note about this scenario is that Hakan is generally considered to be a lower tier character, while Akuma is usually regarded as being quite strong. And while Hakan has a very weak matchup spread overall, he tends to excel against Balrog, while Akuma tends to struggle. On top of this, because Hakan is an overall weaker character than Akuma, PR Balrog had much less experience fighting him, and had to throw away anything he learned in the previous three rounds, as well as any practice he did to prepare for said match. To show you how hype of a moment this was, I'll just let you listen to the crowd when Infiltration moved his cursor to Hakan. As you heard, this was a hard counter. Infiltration was backed into a corner, but instead of flailing about with Akuma, he showed his preparedness and resolve by switching to a character specifically to beat PR Balrog and PR Balrog alone. From all the footage that I could find, Infiltration does not play Hakan at any other point during this entire tournament. He prepared this character for this exact specific scenario, and because of it, he was able to give the FGC one of the most impressive and hype-filled comebacks it's ever seen. So, I ask you, in this scenario, was Hakan a weak pick for a character? No! Hakan was an excellent pick for this scenario, and while he may struggle against most of the cast, he was an excellent choice for this fight. But he's low tier, I hear some of you say. That means he isn't good. Well, I have a message to you. Character strength is relative. Relative to the enemy's character. Relative to the enemy player themselves. Relative to the competitive scene relative to even the popularity of the game's most prominent characters. For an example of a character that struggles not because of a poor matchup spread, but because of a general weakness to the characters that are good, let's take a look at Guilty Gear Xart's Axel Lowe. Okay, well, maybe he struggles a little bit because of him just not being as good as other characters, but but that's that's not the main reason why he struggles. You see, while it's true that Axel has a fairly limited pressure game and semi-predictable options, he has a surprising amount of coverage and is generally never in a situation where he feels as if he is oppressively overpowered. That being said, Axel does have his fair share of bad matchups, but then again, every character in any fighting game does, so why are Axels so impactful? Despite what event homes may try to lead you to believe, Axel doesn't actually have that bad of a matchup spread. Sure, he might have to work a little bit harder to win in some scenarios, 
but such is the life of a low tier. What the real kicker is, is who his losing matchups are against. Axel heavily struggles against characters such as Johnny, Melia, Chip, Venom, and struggles slightly against characters like Soul, Slayer, Kai, Raven, and Elfeld. Now, what you'll notice about the characters I just listed is that every single one of them is either hyper popular or top tier. Because every single character Axel loses to is either super good or super popular, this means if you enter a tournament with Axel alone, the chances of you getting matched against a losing matchup are almost 100%, and the matchups he does win are against some of the least popular characters in the game. To dive more deeply into how big of an issue this is for Axel, let's look at these matchups using a rough matchup chart I made for Axel in preparation for this video that was revised and accepted by some higher level Axel players. For his winning matchups, he has Zato 1, contender for the most difficult character in the game, and also contender for the worst. Due to the fact that he is so hard and so weak means that rarely anybody picks up this character. Potemkin, a slow grappler character who is also in contention for the worst character in the game. Jacko, whose odd and micromanagey playstyle makes her unpopular with the general public, and who is also a lower tier character. Dizzy, who is actually considered to be a pretty viable character, is very unorthodox and as such not the most popular pick out of there, and Heihun whose lack of Gatlings make him an unpopular pick as well. This leaves Eno as Axel's only outstanding matchup, as Eno is both very strong and also semi-popular at top level play as well. Eno is also very hard and thus scary to pick up, but we've picked at everyone else, so let's just leave her alone for now. For Axel's bad matchups, you have Johnny, regarded as the best character in the game, and thus very popular for tournament play. Venom, also one of the game's top tiers. Melia, also one of the game's top tiers. Chip, who while not a top tier per se, is definitely a character you'll see a fair amount of in higher level play, and isn't the worst character either. Raven, who isn't the worst character to struggle against, but definitely someone you'll run into somewhat often. Elfelt, another one of the top tiers. And the last two characters aren't that bad of matchups, but Axel definitely has a tough time with these guys. And when these guys are Kai, the second most popular character in the game, and Soul, the poster child for the game, as well as the most popular character in the game for both low level and competitive play, as well as a high tier character, things start to not look so good for our good friend Axel. So, even though Axel's matchups aren't the worst in a void, the fact that he wins against characters you don't ever see and loses against characters you see all the time means that whatever chance Axel had of overcoming his innate weaknesses as a character are just absolutely beaten to a pulp by the fact that 9 times out of 10, you're gonna be playing a losing battle. Now, both of the characters we've discussed so far are generally considered to be lower tier. But how about a case where a character is considered high tier, but actually isn't that great of a character at all? What about a character whose strength isn't relative to the matchups in the game, but his tools outside of the battle? Well, let me introduce you to Captain Commando from Marvel vs. Capcom 2. You see, in Marvel vs. Capcom, when you choose a character, you actually have three things to consider to determine their overall strength. Their combat power, their DHCs, and their assists. Most top tier characters such as Sentinel or Storm have high power in not only combat power, but in the other two aspects as well, such as Sentinel's excellent DHC Super Drones, or Storm's excellent DHC Super Hailstorm. However, Captain Commando has strength in neither of these departments. His strength when out on the field is lacking at best, and his DHCs are overwhelmingly average. Where Commando really shows his value is in his assists. Captain Commando has access to one of, if not the strongest assist in the game, being Captain Corridor. This is an assist that covers the entire vertical space above Captain Commando, and in a game where there are characters like Storm who can float above in the sky for seemingly forever, is an amazing thing to be able to simply throw down whenever you want. Because of this assist, Captain Commando is seen on a lot of pro teams, and is generally considered to be a very viable character, simply due to the fact that his assist is as powerful as it is. In a game like Marvel vs. Capcom, you have to consider how strong a character is relative to all possible situations you could be using them in. So while Captain Commando may struggle as a base character, the advantage he gives to other characters as a support is so powerful, it places him up on the tier list with characters that can run circles around him on the field. Commando's field strength relative to the other characters may be weak, but his relative strength as an assist compared to other assists is so strong that his overall strength, relative to every character in the game, ends up being very favorable for the captain, 
which is an amazing example of how tiers in a game aren't solely based off of how strong a character is when they're fighting. Now, most of the characters we discussed are generally considered low tier, but as Infiltration showed us, that doesn't mean they aren't worth playing. Hakan was an excellent pick for the Balrog matchup, in the same way that Axel would be an excellent pick for the Eno matchup. And while these characters tend to struggle in most of their matches, don't take this as me saying that you shouldn't main these characters, or that you should restrict them to being sub only. Hell, I main Axel in Xart, and I tend to do just fine without a secondary. The point I was trying to communicate wasn't that weaker characters shouldn't be played, except for in situations they can win in. The point was that a character's overall strength is not a one-dimensional determinant of how the character will perform in the scene they are being played in. And while most of the examples I used are of bad characters having a few good matchups, there are absolutely situations where a character has only a few winning matchups against the most popular characters in the game, and that's what makes said character strong. I'm simply saying that just because this one character has this arbitrary letter assigned to them, and that letter happens to be a low letter, this does not mean the character is unplayable, or an objectively worse character to take time to learn. Every character has a reason to be main, so I don't want the takeaway from this video to be that characters like Axel or Hakan should only be subs. Like I said, I main Axel in Exart, and I have been known to dabble in Hakan, so I'll be the first to say that tiers shouldn't matter. The point of this video was to exemplify how tier lists can be misleading, and that they don't represent a character's overall strength, just how well they perform in a high-level environment, which, let's be honest, a very low percent of us are at. With that out of the way, this has been Adventure, and I hope to see you in the next one. Peace.